your church wherever you are. This is RCA Go. You're watching Todd Talks from RCA Church with Pastor Todd Black. We're finishing up on a series in Imperfect People. And I don't know about you, but uh, this is one of those that um, either you just want to continue going on because it's so good and it's practical, or you're like me, it's like, man, this is hitting close to home. I'm not sure that this is uh, good. No, it's, it's good, but it's uh, challenging because it just speaks to us right where we are. So I, I looked, got to church this morning, and I looked at my email, and um, my wife and I, we do communicate verbally, but we, a lot of times just we text each other in the house, we email each other, and so I just noticed she sent me an email yesterday, and it was her devotional yesterday, and so she emailed it to me, and let me, I'm finding it here. So, okay, so she, she emailed her devotional yesterday, um, and the devotional was this. It says, just fix yourself. I don't know what she's implying there, if that's <laughs> implying it should be for me. Just fix yourself, and it says marriage has its challenges, and, uh, you know, people spend a lot of time and energy in their relationship, and, you know, it's just, um, you know, I started reading a little bit. I said, man, this is, this is, I, this must be for you, honey. <laughs> Then I went on to today, this is when I got to church today, and I'm like, another one. She is like sending me a message. And the devotional today, and so take a look at your outline. And the, her devotional today was the secret to conflict resolution. Now, is God honing in on us? I mean, is this devotional she, he's giving to her, the message I'm speaking today? We have not talked, collaborated, and I'm thinking, man. Uh, but if there's anything, you ask her if there's anything in our marriage relationship that I say, you know, we, I've shared with you, we have our struggles and challenges just like you do. But if there's anything that I would say is the number one problem, well, let me back up. If you go ask Kimberly and say, what is the number one problem Todd thinks in their marriage relationship? I mean, if there's anything that we just struggle with, she would tell you what? Conflict resolution. Kimberly, if we could just get conflict resolution, forget about the problems. Well, we need to fix this over here. And I said, no, conflict resolution, because we could fix this problem, but there's going to be another problem, and another one, another one. And so if we can't learn how to resolve the conflict we have, who cares what the problem is? Because there's going to be problems. There's going to be conflict in marriage. And everybody said amen? amen. There's going to be conflict in marriage. And so doesn't it make sense, you're on my side, doesn't it make sense if we learned how to resolve conflict, it doesn't matter what the problem is, right? All right, let's pray. Let's go home. <laughs> no, really, I, you think I'm joking, and I'm not. This is, this is a real, real deal in our household of dealing with, with conflict and conflict resolution. I, way off course here, um, as far as um, um, the aspect of just this topic, and, and it's just one, I guess, because it's just, I couldn't believe it when I'm, you know, I, I chose this topic, obviously, a number of directions I could have gone, and then Kim sends me that, and, but, but there's no joke, if I, if I could nail down and just say, you know what, how do we resolve conflict? When I meet with couples and pre-marriage uh, meetings and, and, you know, resolving conflict in a marriage situation that things have just gone bad, it's like, you know, number one, you need to learn your love languages. Learn your love language. What is your love language? You need to learn your personalities. What kind of personality are you? Some people are, are like, man, they're just quick, fired up. You know I mean? You just bring it on. You say something and bring it on and game on. And it's just uh, crazy. And then the other person may say, you know, I just need to back off. I don't want to talk about it. I just want to just, or I, I just want to just go and then we'll deal with it. Well, that in itself, those, those dynamics there bring about the most difficult conflict resolution because if you don't understand your spouse's personality, the personality at your workplace, coworkers, and how they respond because not everybody responds and reacts like you do. Not everybody has the same personality. And so when you understand that and understand, okay, I've got to get a little patience here, a little grace because they just need to sit back and they need to just not engage right at the moment, and then you've got the other person where they're just saying, you know, come on, you're, you're, you're whistling and you're singing and humming, like, how could you be doing that at this time? We need to resolve this, we need to get it fixed, and so those are some key areas I think that are no doubt 
um, important as we get into this message. So that first part is just uh, free, and, and, but it is, it is so critical in relationships, just generally speaking. So we've been in three weeks, short little series here. Um, obviously, we've talked about some different aspects, and I'll let you take a look at the, the uh, RCA Go or website, and you can follow up with some of the messages there. I, I won't take the time to uh, dive into those because I want to hit on the specifics of today. And so if you're old enough to remember you, um, and it's not too old, but it's just my generation, remember in high school, junior high, hearing the song from Pat Benatar, it says, love is a battlefield. You remember that one? Love is a battlefield. And I did a quick search on YouTube, and I had no idea this, I, you know, I didn't even know the words of the, sto- of the song, but then the whole video of it, everything was just, just crazy. But, but love is a battlefield came to my mind when I thought about conflict resolution, because anybody who has ever loved would say there's Love is a battlefield. It is a battlefield because there's good and there's bad, and, and sometimes many of us know exactly what that means, uh, battlefield and love. How can those two go together? And it feels like that every relationship, sometimes if this is you, you find that sometimes in every relationship, it just always seems to be that way. There's pain, and there's difficulties in relationships, and there's always conflict and then everyone has different styles of conflict resolution, and, and we all respond differently. And so it just, it's just a mess. And so it's been a mess from the first message three weeks ago when we identified we're all imperfect people. And when you take two people who are imperfect and you put them in the same house together over a period of years, and those years become, I mean, those years become a lifetime, and you f- find out rather quickly that there is a battlefield at times that go on in that household. Now, I know there's been some crazy, crazy stories that people say, we, we just never fight. I'm like, please tell me, how, how is that possible? And especially newlyweds. And, and if they're not married yet and they say, we never fight, I'm like, you need to get in a fight now. I mean, we're going we're gonna to stir one up. I'm serious. If you've never been in a fight and you're not married and you're engaged, you need to get in a fight because... How in the heck are you going to know how to resolve that conflict? I mean, it's a difficult thing. Unless you can make it your whole lifetime without, without fighting, you've got, and I don't mean that, I, it's really true. I don't, we've got some here that'll, that will probably vouch for that, but it's so true because how you resolve those conflict is just, it's different night and day between each of us. And so who is it in your life, in the relationship aspect of of um, not only spouses, uh, we've got workplace environment relationships, we've got friendships, neighbors, coworkers, um, friends at school. Who in your life, in a relationship, whatever that might be, is kind of an oil water kind of a situation where you just do not get along with that person? It's just night and day difference. There is somebody that probably comes into your mind immediately. Somebody who comes in your mind immediately. I want you to take a look at the equation on the screen and on your outline. In fact, if you'd like to follow along in your outline in the bulletin, or you can follow along in our YouVersion app, um, and a great resource there as well. You plus who equals conflict. You plus who, don't say it out loud, you plus who equals conflict. It may be your spouse. It may be one of your kids. You know, you think of conflict, sometimes the biggest conflict you have is with your kids because they're a lot like you. It could be not only one kid, it could be all your kids. It could be a coworker, a guy or girl at school. It could be someone in your life that is causing you turmoil because of the conflict going on in that, that relationship. And so I want you to take a second, maybe write that down. Write it down. Me plus Joe, Sue, whoever it might be, equals conflict. This is, this is so important, and this is not going to be putting them on the um, uh, hit list. But this is, this is an area that if you've identified that person and there is somebody that comes quickly to mind, today's message will be huge for you because the fact that that person's right there, maybe, maybe there's not an immediate issue that hasn't been resolved, but probably more than likely, there's probably an issue with somebody that you've just thought of, an issue that has been unresolved. An issue that God obviously wants us to take our part 
regardless of what they do, regardless of how they respond, regardless if they even want to listen to us or not, we have a responsibility to resolve that conflict, to be at peace in the situation. And as a result of that, then we're, we've done our part, we're good. And let God begin to deal with the other person's part. So I want to give you a couple of truths regarding conflict. Number one, conflict is going to happen. Conflict is going to happen. I rest my case. Let's not figure out the problems that we should, but let's not figure out the problems specifically because if we are not resolving conflict, it doesn't matter what the problem is. There will always be problems, but, but if we can resolve and learn how to manage conflict, um, it will help us resolve anything we face in our marriage. And so again, you put two imperfect people working on the same job 40 hours a week, Eventually, eventually, whether that's a working relationship, whether it's a friendship, whether it's a, a marriage relationship, eventually, that honeymoon experience is going to be over. It's going to be over, and it's not any longer going to be the happiest place on earth. You know, when that just euphoria love in the first couple years is just amazing, and, and there could do no wrong, and all of a sudden, things begin to change. It's not very pleasant sometimes in that household or a working place environment. And then you take adding kids, that adds more tension and more conflict. Then you add both sets of parents, and that's even more conflict. And then you add opinions, and it doesn't stop there because then you go to work, and you're working with imperfect people, and, and you know, it was great when they first, you first got together working, but then over a period of time, it's not so fun anymore. You're, you're kind of annoyed by the things that that person does. And it doesn't stop there because... Quite a few imperfect people that you have to work alongside of, they as well um, are going to find themselves in just the same situation at home, the same situation with neighbors, all this conflict, which it just breeds just tension. And you look around us, and if it weren't for God, we would be just a mess. I mean, we would be a mess, honestly. If it weren't for God, we would be a mess because every one of us are so flawed and so messed up, there's no way that we could, could do anything right. And and I say that because as believers, I mean, we don't do things. None of us do things right and perfect. But, man, we just really mess things up a lot of times as believers when God's given us clear instruction. And so I can't imagine what it would be like without Christ in our lives when we hopefully come to a place and at, at not allow things to go too long before we're saying, God, it's by your grace that I'm saved. And who am I to judge that person? Who am I to hold a grudge against them? And so conflict is going to happen. You can't avoid it. Here's the second thing about conflict. Conflict can actually be good. It can actually be good. Some of you are thinking, that is impossible. How could that happen? Maybe you grew up in a home where, where conflict was the norm. And you didn't know anything else until you got married. And, and he or she was in a household. They said, you know, do your parents ever talk? Does it mean... You know, when, when things liven up, well, this is just normal. And maybe for some of you, normal would be, you know, it's like if it's not screaming and throwing things and using the TV remote, not only as a remote, but also as a weapon, it, that's normal to you. And the fact that you've got pictures hung in, in funky places is because there's holes in the wall. You've got pictures covering those holes. But maybe extreme, but for many people, that is the norm. And you talk about conflict in marriage when you take two households and dealing with things that you've seen through the years, dealing with it very differently than your spouse has done because she's watched her parents or he and they saw things much, much differently. That's a radical, radical shock. But there can actually be some good that comes from it. And you relate this to exercising, weightlifting, uh, just about anything that that allows you to become better and to grow, causes some stretching, causes some, some uh, changes in your life. And, and I think the greatest example of that is, is weightlifting, and you go in, you, you, you're really pumping up, and certain days you, you just, you really put on the weight because you want to tear, not literally, but, but you want to tear the muscle in order for it to be broken down so it can grow bigger. I mean, that's essentially, I don't know if that's exactly right, but, but that's the heart of it, is, is it you, you got to do the work and effort. There's a lot of pain. It's not fun. But in the end, it's well worth it because of what you went through. And the same thing can actually happen in conflicts in relationships. Your relationship can actually get better and stronger as a result of the conflict. 
In fact, I, I, I would just deal with this so often, uh, whether it's staff or whether it's just people in general. And, and we've got small groups, and, and I think small groups are the greatest, um, kind of the greatest spot to kind of allow life to just happen and, and to exercise your, your faith and to exercise patience and exercise resolving conflict because there are things in that, in that small group that are going to happen that are just, they just happen because you're imperfect people. And so something might happen. There might be a conflict and tensions rise a little bit. And, and you know, I may have someone say, you know, I just, I, I can't put up with that group. I mean, I, there's such a tension there. And I, I'm like, you know what? You need to get right back in there. Get back in there. And you guys need to resolve it. Or maybe a small group. You guys need to resolve it. And haven't you found that when you take the time to work it out, and especially if the other person is open and receptive, and, and you're both open and receptive, I mean, it just makes you healthier and stronger as a result. I just had a, a conversation recently with somebody on the phone. And I get this a lot. And the previous church I was at, I was the executive pastor. So I didn't do any ministry. I just had, oversaw all the staff and pastors. And, and the thing about it was is that I would have sometimes a volunteer that was volunteering under a, a pastor in, in ministry, a children's, a youth pastor. And that person would oftentimes shoot me an email, make a phone call, make an appointment, and they would say, I just want to come in, and I, you know, I am so frustrated at Pastor So-and-so. I, they're just, it's just so frustrating. And I said, well, share with me what's going on. And I said, you know what? I said, I'm probably not going to allow this conversation to go on much farther because the person you need to deal with is Pastor So-and-so, the person you have the problem with. And so I said, as a result of coming to me, it's like, I, I'm not really going to take it anywhere. I, I want to listen, make sure there's nothing, you know, things I need to immediately respond to. But you need to go back to that person, set an appointment, have a conversation with him. If that doesn't work out, guess what? You call in a third party, which might be me, and the three of us. We're going to get this worked out. And that's just a biblical approach. And so just recently, I had the same situation calling. And I said, you know what's going to happen if, if you bypass the person you have a problem with and come to me and I deal with the situation, you have gained nothing, gained nothing in that relationship with that other person. You've gained nothing. And maybe it's respect. Maybe it's something of, of, of working through those difficult times that it helps you be stronger and healthier in a relationship. How many agree with that? If you've operated like that, it's just, that's the way, way to do it. That's the way to, that we should be operating. And it's just unfortunate because not everyone operates the same way. But today... This is the heart of it is that you don't have to worry about the other person. Just worry about you. Worry about you. Do what you do according to God's word and let God take care of the rest. And so obviously none of us want to go through conflict, but it's going to be there. It's going to be out there. And my challenge to you this morning is you might be a person. What if you're a person who doesn't like conflict? Who doesn't like, you know, confront, confronting someone? Who doesn't like that? And, you know, I'm not ever shy of that, and, and my wife would say, you're, you're just, you look for it. No, I don't. I don't look for it. But it's like, I just, I just, I'm not one to put things under the rug, and, but other people, they are, and they just, just want to let it just, and so we all tiptoe around it, kind of like the series we did with the Elephant in the Room. Everybody knows what it is, but we just kind of slide it under the room, and I want to deal with it head on. Let's just, I mean, what is there that could possibly separate us that God couldn't take care of? What is there, what, what could there be? And we might resolve to the fact that we agree to disagree, but we're going to be at peace with each other. We're going to be at peace. And you'll see here, God's word says that's all, that's all he's looking for, is that we be at peace with one another. So here's some of the styles of conflict. Styles of conflict that many of us do have, and this is the challenge when it comes to uh, dealing with one another. And, and one of the first ones I want us to look at is those who live with it. We just live with it. We sweep it under the rug. We compartmentalize it into a portion of our life, and, and we just, you know, every day we kind of clean it out and clean out the big areas, the obvious areas, and we shove the rest of the stuff into the closet, and we shut the door into our, our personal lives. And we walk around with a smile on our face, acting like everything is fine. We never get upset, and everything's just wonderful, and our family's wonderful, and everything's great. But it, all we've done is, is just shut it down and, and press it down. Kind of, I, I kind of think of it as a, the trash compactors. You put trash in, it just compacts the trash. And the more and more you put in there, it just, it, I mean, 
after a while, if you don't get rid of it, even though it's compacting it, it begins to stink. It begins to smell. And so probably not the healthiest type of, of response in dealing with conflict is to live with it. The problem with living with it is that you're going to take that junk that you've compacted and pressed down, and if it's not working in this relationship, you'll take it to the next relationship, and guess what? You've got the same problems. Same problems. And guess what? I've seen this, and again, just because I deal with people, that you will marry. I mean, almost looks. I mean, looks, I've seen so many. You marry a very similar person to what you are married before, and you find yourself in the same exact problems, and all because you're not dealing with it. I believe this. If you dealt with it in the beginning, you probably wouldn't be on to the second relationship and so on and so forth. So we have to understand of emptying out the junk. Don't sweep it under the rug. Don't allow it to be just uh, uh, something that's just there and we learn to live with it. Secondly is this. Secondly is this. Is we learn to leave it. Those who leave it. The minute we see conflict coming, you take off running for your life. You avoid it. Maybe you disengage from it. You act like you don't hear what's going on. You turn up the TV. You don't want anything to do with it. But the problem is it creates this incredible wound inside of us. And we just, we, we leave it. And we don't deal with it. We want to run again from one relationship to another, and it just that begins to fester, and it never, never fully heals itself because we never allow it to be dealt with. Here's the third way some of us deal with it, and that is we level it. We level it. The mentality of this individual is to just destroy it or anyone that gets in their path. And so you're the person who might say, you know, I don't mind conflict. Bring it on. Let's go. Bring on the conflict. I'm just going to annihilate it. And so you yell at people and you throw things. You see, again, your car maybe is transportation now, so a weapon man. You're cutting people off and you're able to impose your will onto people because of your, your, just your, your statue, because of your voice, because of the things that your dad did and you saw that model, your mom and you just find yourself just doing the same exact thing. And while everyone else around you is trying to just live with it, we're trying to annihilate it. And here's the deal. The problem is the way we deal with conflict can ruin our relationships. The way we deal with conflict can ruin our relationships. And without a doubt, it's one of the, the top top areas, and I've already mentioned this at the beginning of the message, it's one of the top areas that I just find that we see in, in marriages, and I keep referencing marriages because that's just the, the obviously one that's quantified because people get pre-marriage counseling, and I, I do that, and so they get these pre-marriage counseling. I think I mentioned to you the test that they take, and, it, and it's about nine key areas of critical areas of, of marriage and relationships. And so it deals with things with communication, conflict resolution, uh, finances, faith, parenting, sex, um, I don't know what are the, uh, some of the other areas. It covers all the major areas. And this test comes back, and we basically get a report of the husband, the wife, or soon-to-be husband and wife, and it, and it basically puts him on a chart that says this. You know what? Joe is, is man, is high on, on this. And then Sue's way down here. And so that tells me that that's a major area of differences that we need to take a look at. Every, every time, what would you guess be the top two Areas that are, are major areas. Sex and money. I Maybe it's, it's communication. And this is not, not worldwide, nationwide. This is just my, as I meet with couples, and they go through the test, it's communication, conflict resolution, um, and, and then you've got faith. Depending on somebody from a, a different religion, that's a huge issue, and obviously uh, money is as well, but but those couple are the top ones: communication and conflict resolution. Because you've got two different people, two different personalities, and one personality is so you know just passive, and and so how they respond to that is so different than the person who might be one who's more aggressive. And so the way that we deal with conflict can ruin a relationship. Because you think about you think about the the areas and the direction in that 
situation, in that problem and where it goes, again, I don't believe it's, it's the problem because we're going to have problems in conflict. So we can figure out the conflict. We can get an expert in. We can get a financial analysis done. We can get all sorts of things done. But if we cannot get the conflict resolved because it escalates, because it goes beyond, it goes extreme, and, and we're, we're not even then dealing with the situation, we're dealing with the conflict that has just got out of hand as a result of, of um, not seeing eye to eye and how we deal with it at that moment. And so in the time we have left, I want to talk to us about the better way to handle conflict. And because conflict is inevitable, we're all going to face it, um, we've got to have some different tools. Unless you are here today and, and you say, you know, we don't, have any, we don't have any problems in this area, we don't have conflict, it doesn't, doesn't lead to anywhere bad, then this is, you're the exception to the rule. But I think most of us would say we need some better tools in how we relate to one another and deal with, with uh, some of the conflict in our life. So part of getting the right tools, though, is you've got to ask the right questions. You've got to ask the right question. And so instead of asking, you know, how do I live with this? How do I live with this? How do I avoid it? Or how do I win? How do I come out on top? As we talked about last week, in any relationship, you don't need an opponent, you need a partner. You don't need an opponent, you need a partner. And so the question we should be asking is this. What is the goal when it comes to conflict? What is the goal? Because every time you go into conflict, you have to ask yourself, what is the objective here? And again, a little bit last week, is you know the objective is not to just win at all costs. It's, it, it is a loss for you, and it's a loss for the relationship. But when you're partnered together, there is no attitude that says, we need to win, I need to win. Or that I'm just going to prove my point, or I'm just going to somehow get out of it. What is the goal that we should be trying to achieve? Now, I've been there, I know I'm not thinking, hey, what's the goal here? We've got conflict. <laughs> it's not doesn't hit me there. But I think it's like many other things, we decide up front the rules of engagement, we decide that we're going to fight fair, we decide the parameters of our relationship, and from there, we're probably not going to be asking it because we already know. What's the, what's the goal? Our goal is we're going to resolve this and hope to God we never deal with it again, that we deal with it in, in a way that is constructive, a way that is healthy. And so what is the goal that we should be trying to achieve? And obviously, find the Bible is, is so specific in some areas, and this is one of the areas he's, the Bible is very specific in how to deal with conflict. The Apostle Paul, many of you know, a follower of Jesus and a radical change in his life, wrote nearly half the New Testament. And, and he, in the early years of the church being born, he was writing these letters to all these new believers, all these new churches, and he was basically telling them that, hey, here's how, how you live out the faith. Here's the practical things. And because you had imperfect people, who now became believers, and guess what? They still had conflict. I mean, they were still griping over what color are the pews going to be, be? What color is the carpet going to be? Are we going to have this? Gonna... I mean, they were arguing, and there was conflict. And so Paul, being an eyewitness to Christ, his crucifixion, his teachings, his miracles, there was no, nobody better firsthand to help them to know how they're to live out this faith and to follow after Christ. And so Paul writes in Romans 12, of what the goal of resolving conflict should be. In Romans 12, verse 8, it says, If it is possible, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with a few people. Everyone. Live at peace with everyone. Do we read that right? Every, live at peace with everyone? I, I mean, I know there's... Most of us say, I don't live at peace. I, mean, I want to avoid that person. I want to get away because there's just not anything of peace about being around that person. But that's a huge, huge statement being made there. Be at peace with everyone. And let's break it down. You look at the first phrase there. It says, if it is possible. If it is possible. If there is a chance. If it's remotely possible. If there's a one in a million chance. If it would be possible. You make every effort as far as you need to go to make amends, to be at peace with that person. Well, they, they know where to find me. They know where to find me if, if they need to apologize. They can come looking for me. 
Well, they know, they know how to get a hold of me. They've got my number. If they need to make amends, they know, they got my address. Oh, <laughs> they'll get over it. They'll get over it. I sent them an email. It should be fine. It should suffice. Paul is saying, though, as far as possible, you are to go to every link possible. As far as it depends on who? You. Don't assume that it's someone else's problem. Don't say, well, I'll apologize if they apologize. Well, the ball's in their court. Ball's in their court. The goal of conflict is peace. Is peace to come out of it. If it is possible, as far as it depends on me, you, live at peace with everyone. And live at peace does not mean some fake, sweep it under the carpet, kind of a, a you know, I, I think of just a, a coma, kind of just like you're just not there. Lights are on, nobody's home because you're just checked out because it's, well, that's just peace. I can't really deal with anything. I can't resolve anything. I can't, you know, confront anyone. I can't get any headway in this situation. It's not that whatsoever. As far as it depends on you, do whatever it takes to live at peace with one another. And so because when you do that, you're able to have peace about the situation, even though you might not have peace in the situation. You can have peace about the the circumstances and and the the situation at large, even though you, you don't have peace about there's a peace between me and you because we're both good. Because it might not be good with the other person, but the peace you have is you've done everything you could on your part. Because here's the deal. Some people, some people will never forgive. There's some people who won't accept your apology. Some people who just will not let you off the hook. And some people just won't get over it. And he's not saying as, it, as far as it depends on you, make sure they get over it. You know, you do everything you can, and you're, you don't, you're not off the hook either until you make sure that they, they get over it, until you make sure that they've fixed this problem, until they've uh, forgiven you. It doesn't say that. You get to the place, you get to the point where you have a peace about it because you've done everything you can, and then, then you have a peace in it. Because again, it's, it's, you can have a peace on the bigger picture, but you can have also a peace in it because you're not in control of the other person. You're in control of yourself. So the goal is peace. So I know, again, what you're thinking is, especially if you're new to the Christian faith and saying, it's just crazy. I mean, this is like something that's a perfection. How could we even possibly do this? And, and yeah, like you said, people are imperfect. But here's the deal. You might say, I've tried to say I'm sorry. I've asked for their forgiveness. I've even sent them flowers and candy. I mean, how much farther do I need to go for them to get over this? You don't know what they've said to me. You don't know the things that they've done. And again, here he's saying is the goal is peace. So how do we go about it? And that's why the words of Jesus are so important and so significant because my methods, I know, and many of your methods are not cutting it to resolve conflict. I, I think if we could resolve conflict, there would not be any divorces. I mean, with a, a few exceptions, but, but there would not be any divorces because... Again, by the time people end up in my office, they end up in my office, it's a succession of conflicts that have built and built and built that have never been dealt with, that have been swept under the rug, and by the time they get there, I'm like, why even bother coming to me? I mean, outside of calling on Jesus and praying for a miracle, there's no shot, no shot of this marriage making it. And so dealing with the conflict up front, dealing with it in a way that, that is right there, not dishing under the carpet, but our methods are obviously not working. And so Jesus actually gives us some instruction on this of what to do, of what to do when someone wrongs you and what to do when you wrong someone else. So at the beginning of the message, I asked you to put down a name. I had the, the uh, equation there, you plus who equals conflict. And I'm sure most of us probably thought of someone that we thought, hey, this person is a person I've, I've got conflict with. And if you thought of them, it's probably because that conflict is not resolved. It's unresolved issues. And so my question to you is, how is your method of, of resolving conflict working for you? And it's probably not working well because that person is still 
right there on your mind. So what if we took Jesus' advice and how, how do we deal with this conflict? And the first one he's going to deal with is, is what do you do with people who have wronged me? They've hurt you. They've upset you. And this is what he says in Matthew chapter 18 and verse 15. He says this, if your brother or sister sins, this is not if your brother or sister annoys you, if that person doesn't use the proper email etiquette, if that person, you know, taps the, taps the, if you're here last, it, it's not about that. If the person drives slow in the fast lane or chews with their mouth open, that's not what he's talking about. He's, what he's talking about here is, are those who've lied against you, those who've cheated against you, who, who stole from you, who've hurt you, who abused you, sin, the things that, that, that are obviously far more than just these trivial things. He says, if someone does that to you, here's what Jesus says. You should share, you should share it as a prayer request in this week's upcoming small group. I mean, that's what we do, right? We do that. So this week in the small group, when you get in that small group around and you wait, get to the prayer time, you say, you know, I just want to lift up to you my boss, Mike, and I know most of you know Mike because Mike comes, goes to our church here, and, but Mike's been really a jerk recently at, at work, and I don't know. I mean, I'm just, it's hearsay, but I hear his wife left him, and, and uh, after work, some of the guys saw his, his car parked at the bar, and you know, I, you know, I hear it, he's on Facebook, I'll show you because, so you know who he is, here's a picture of him. And we're gonna, I want to just pray for him because he's just been a jerk. I mean, just, and obviously that's the way we deal with these situations. But we share oftentimes with everyone else or with key people in our life except for the person we need to share it with. No one else needs to hear that garbage except that person that you have a conflict with. For years, I, I, wherever I got this, and it's nothing new, but, but I've used this so often that if I'm talking, and there's a problem, if there's a situation that is, that is just a problem, and I've shared this with our staff, I say, you know what, unless you're part of the solution, here's a great way to know if you should be tied. Are you part of the solution? I got a problem with Mike. He's such a jerk at work, but I'm going I'm to share it with Kimberly. She's probably not going to be any part of the solution at all. And so unless that person you're talking to is a part of the solution, There's no reason you should be talking to that person about this person. It's a great, great way to kind of keep yourself in check, in line, and you don't end up doing these kinds of things. And so Jesus says, when someone has sinned against you, vaguely post it on social media. So you get this person who posts, says, I hate it when people think, when people who you think are your friends leave you out. Hashtag, I'm never included. Hashtag, I... Act like we were friends at church. And we all like, I know, we know who that is. We know exactly who it is. And it's like their therapy of posting it on, on social media and, or the rants we go on on Facebook and Instagram. Is it really helping the person that sinned against you? Is it really helping them? Look at what Jesus says we're supposed to do. He says, if your brother or sister sins, go and point out their sin. Just between the church and you. Between the two of you, I want you to go. I want you to not wait, not sit in silence, not wait till they figure it out. Go, not hold a grudge. You go to them. Just between the two of you, you walk through what happened. And this is another counseling kind of advice. And, and again, a little, little aspect of that that I do is like, you know, communication is a two-way street. And you talk, listen. She talks, he talks, listen, I heard you say this. And I mean, can you imagine if we actually did that stuff? I mean, we would be communicating very well and getting things resolved much, much better. And so we find here is we go to that person and say, I just want to share. This is, these are my feelings. This is how I feel I've been affected. And you begin to share how that made you feel, how it hurt you. And then the other person hopefully doesn't say, well, that's not true, blah, blah, blah. They say, okay, you know, those are your feelings, but... Here's how I took the situation. And maybe it brings about a greater understanding of what really happened. And maybe, maybe that resolves it right there. Or maybe the person would say, you know, I had no idea that it affected you that way. But Jesus says, he comes right out and tells us how we're supposed to deal with the conflict. You go to that person. And he says, the first thing I want you to do is go to that person who's wronged you. Go directly to them and talk to them. 
question as we wrap up this morning is who do you need to go to? Who do you need to go to? Jesus is saying, even though that person might not own up to it, you will have a chance to be at peace with it because you did your part. Second aspect here and is with people who have wronged you. Here's how we're to deal with people that have wronged us, and then with people we have wronged, what are you supposed to do? Jesus says in Matthew 5, 23, he says, therefore, if you're offering your gift at the altar, if you're offering your gift at the altar, I want to pause right there. Today, we go to church once a week. Um, we don't practice, obviously, a, a situation where, you know, there has to be a high priest, there has to be an altar, and you have to bring sacrifices, and and before you can come and freely worship, we have the freedom because of the sacrifice of Christ made the ultimate sacrifice, the once and for all sacrifice for all mankind. There are no more sacrifices necessary to worship and to come into relationship with God and, and to seek his forgiveness. And so as we do that, that means any day of the week, we can, we can do that in our home. We can do that in the car. We can do that riding a bike. I mean, it, it doesn't have to be here in church. But back in Jesus' day, they went to church once a year. So that means 364 days. They're messing up and they're just, I mean, all this junk. Can you imagine all the junk that they have? 364 days and they're coming to that one day going to church. And it's a huge event. They're bringing their sacrifices. They're bringing their, their, their sacrifice so they can get this stuff off their chest. Can you imagine? And the passage says here, it says, Therefore, if you're offering your gift at the altar... At the altar, he says, goes on, he says, and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you. And so these people go back with me to one day of church a year, bring in a sacrifice, got all this junk, and they're bringing a sacrifice, and they're bringing it, and they're almost there. And he says, but if you have something against your brother or your sister, wait, what are you you saying here? If you got something against your brother or your sister, well, yeah, I do, I do. You know, robbed the guy out of some money. I cheated him on doing his taxes. And, you know, I, I, yeah, I did somebody wrong here. Then he says, leave your gift at the front of the altar. Don't even, don't even bring, leave it at the front. Are you kidding me? 364, I've been carrying, I, I want to I wanna be right. And Jesus continues, he says, I want you to go. In other words, before you come to the altar to fix your relationship with me, You better get your relationships right with one another. So you leave your gift right here. You go and make amends, and then you and I will have a right relationship. I am far from perfect, but it just boggles my mind to have believers and followers of Christ to think we're right here, and we can do some of the things we do with one another horizontally in relationships that that is just... It's like our relationship with Christ stops right here. But it extends to every place that we go. And so he says, first go and be reconciled. Make things right. Then come and offer your gift. I can imagine so many saying, there's no way I could do this. I mean, that's just crazy. I, I couldn't do this. We've waited 365 days to bring this to you, 64 days. My question to you this morning is who, again, do you need to go to? Who do you need to go to? Who do you need to make a phone call to? Maybe it's simple as an email, a letter, meeting at Starbucks. Here's some suggestions. I would do it immediately. Immediately. You take the words here in this passage, last passage where it just... We're, we're trying to be right with God, and yet we're not right with one another. Some of you may need a cooling time because maybe this has just happened and maybe not the time to go and deal with it right now, but you need to do it immediately. Secondly, you need to go directly. Go directly. Not via through your small group, not via through guys or ladies at work or at your, at your uh, sporting event or whatever it might be, but go to them directly, you and them. Thirdly is this, is go humbly. Go humbly. It may be require an apology from you, and it may require you to, to be humble, to walk in, to own your part. 
and to say, you know what, I just want you to know I need healing and I need forgiveness from this situation. I need, been hurt. I've been, you know, it's just humbly, just expressing yourself before them. And it's amazing what happens, it's amazing what happens in a relationship like that, in a situation like that, what God will do in your heart and life in that moment, supernaturally. That's the great thing about Christ is, is God's living within us. And it's not just about, well, I went to them, I talked to them, and they were just cold and shut me off. And you can't do anything about them, but you and yourself, God can work radical changes to bring healing in your heart, whether they ever give you an apology or not. I want to invite you to stand with me if you would. This has been Todd Talks with Pastor Todd Black. Todd Talks is produced by RCA Go for RCA Church in Ridgecrest, California.